I'm excited about today because this is Holy Week. This is a holy week. And, and during this week, this is why um, we got these outlines ready for you. This is not, um, this is a timeline of what Jesus went through, but this isn't everything that he did. If you read the scriptures around it, though, you will find out more about what actually happened in his life. But, but this is like on Monday, well, on Sunday, let's start with Sunday, it's his triumphant entrance into Jerusalem, which I'm going to talk about today. But I want you to read it, and then I want you to thank him with the knowledge of what was really happening. I mean, I think um, we enter into this season looking forward to Easter, and many times I think we enter in looking for Easter so that we can have time with our families and the kids can have fun. And how many of you know there's nothing wrong with families or fun? You know, but this is the holiest time of the year for Christians. Because we are, it's not a bunny week, it's not a candy week, it's not an egg week. You know, it's holy week. Because this is all about Jesus and what he did. And so we are, we are walking this out every day. If, if you'll read this, you'll understand everything that, that Jesus had to do. I mean, he headed toward Jerusalem with purpose. And, and it will help you to thank him every day. This is not supposed to be just a reading guide. This is supposed to be a thank you guide. A being grateful guide. A let's see what Jesus did and then thank him for every step that he took because he was taking every step towards a cross for us. Amen? Okay, so today I want to talk to you about the title of the message is Hosanna. And so we know that this is Palm Sunday. How many of you know it's Palm Sunday? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> and so everybody that's ever been to church at this time of year knows that this is the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem and the people sang Hosanna and waved palm fronds in the air and they laid them on the ground as Jesus passed by. Okay, so... You, let's, let's reiterate that Jesus has been now training his disciples. He's been with them for three and a half years. And one of his best friends, Lazarus, died. And about a week before Palm Sunday, he raised him from the dead. And so his sister Mary anointed Jesus' feet with the oil that would prepare him for his burial. I mean, that is where we are. All along the way, as Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, knowing what his end was going to be, he took the time to stop and to heal people along the way. He healed a blind man. He healed a lame man. Jesus was always more conscious of the needs of other people than he was paying attention to his own needs because he was determined that no matter what it took and he knew what it was going to take, he was going to do it anyway. Nothing could stop this triumphant entry into Jerusalem that week. So let's look to the word and see what it says. So Matthew 21, verse 1. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and they came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Lose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. And all this was done... All of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, a full of, a, the full of a donkey. So Jesus is telling his disciple what, what needs to happen because he knows that the actions that are happening right now are a fulfillment of prophecy. 
And he is making sure that he fulfills every part of what has been prophesied over him. Everything that had to do with the law, Jesus was basically dotting every I, crossing every T, making sure that everything that had been spoken about him was coming to culmination. And so he was going to do it. But let's, let's find out what he's really, what Zechariah was trying to convey to us when Jesus was was reiterating it, but Zechariah initially prophesied it. So when Zechariah was saying it, the first thing that he says is rejoice. Everybody say rejoice. rejoice. Okay. Now rejoice here doesn't just mean sing a little louder. I could tell we were singing a little louder because we got a little excited about Jesus today, and that's good. But rejoice doesn't just mean sing a little louder. The actual definition of this means to spin around. I can't do it. I wish, okay, we're, who's going to volunteer? There you go. Farrell spun around. Farrell, come up here now. <laughs> we're going to make you do it. You, you're, you're my volunteer. <laughs> okay, so it means to spin around. Woo! Because of violent emotion and be glad and be joyful and rejoice. <laughs> okay, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there were people that were doing that, but maybe none like you. <laughs> And then he said, rejoice greatly, which means to do it louder and louder and more intensely to a great extent. So basically, this is not your normal kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. No, it is like you are now under the anointing of God. Zechariah was, was penning this. He was writing this down by the Holy Spirit, and he was getting and feeling the emotion of this. And the words that he was writing, he was trying to describe how our emotional realm should react to the fact that our king is coming. And so he's saying, don't just, don't just take this lightly when you see him coming, when he's coming to you, when he's coming on a donkey, it is time for you to not only rejoice, but it is time for you to go a little bit berserk in your rejoicing. Yeah. So don't hold back your emotions when it comes to the king, when it comes to what he's doing on purpose for all of us. There should be nothing that we should be ashamed of. There should be no restraint on our voice, no restraint on our actions, no, no trying to make other people think that we're acting properly because he alone is worthy and Zechariah knew it when he was writing it and he was trying to get us to join in what he is saying. Amen? And so... Then he says, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, and shout. Shout, O daughter. Now, why would he say rejoice with all of that def definition in the meaning of it? And then rejoice greatly, and then he goes on to say shout, because shout is even more intense. And it means to, it comes from the root word, Johnny, ruah. Ruah, we know that, we, we studied that out. Okay, and ruah means figuratively to split the ears with sound. All you people who don't like loud sounds, Zechariah told you to split the guy's ears next to you. <laughs> only in this case, only in this case. It, it means blow an alarm, cry out loud, make a joyful noise, be smart and shout for joy. <laughs> Sound an alarm and triumph for your God. So he's saying, okay, here you go. Here he comes. Behold, your king is coming to you. And your responsibility is to receive him with great thanksgiving and emotion. Amen. Amen. So can you imagine? I mean, like, I would, well, when I get to heaven, I, I swear I'm going to have God rerun all of these things. I want to see Zechariah when he's writing this. 
I want to I want to see what that moment was like when he was getting a revelation of this because it wasn't just foretelling it was foretelling it was for the people at the moment but it was also for all of us and he knew it and he was feeling everything that was going on oh, yeah I want to see it okay so he is writing this to make us aware of how intense what the Spirit was trying to say. So he says, your king is coming to you. I want to announce to you today that our king is coming. And he's coming to you. And he's coming for you. Amen. And he is just... And he is having salvation. Now, why did he say all of that? Because when he says that he is righteous, he is just having salvation, it means this. He is coming as your defender. He is coming as your deliverer. He is coming as your helper. He is coming as your rescuer. He is coming as your savior. He is coming to bring you safety. And he is your avenger. Make no mistake about it, Captain America is not the greatest adventure. <laughs> Who is? Ah, Jesus is. And so Zechariah declares him as the king. But this king doesn't want to come into the city riding on a horse. He doesn't want to come in like a warmonging king. He wants to come in in humility. He's coming as the Prince of Peace. He is coming with his heart before his father, knowing that in humility he will bring forth what the people need. He is doing this on purpose so that they are not looking at somebody who is all pomp and status, and we need to take lessons from him. But he is saying, I am coming, and I want you to see how I come. I want you to see how I come and how I position my heart. I want you to understand that as I come, I know why I'm coming, and I know what it's going to do for everyone, even when you don't know. But he was positioning himself and he was letting them see that he was coming in a spirit of humbleness before his father so that he could fulfill his will. And so he came and you know that the multitude, Matthew 21, 8, a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road and others cut down branches from the trees and they spread them on the road. And the multitudes who went before and who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, at this moment, they cried Hosanna. But Hosanna doesn't just mean, it does mean praise. It does mean worship. It does mean shout. But it also means this, save us. And so these people are under Roman rule. They have heard of Jesus. They, have, they, have, they very much are aware. He just came from Bethany with Lazarus and Mary. It's just a little while away from them. And they know he raised him from the dead. They know that he laid hands on the sick and they recovered. They heard about all of his miracles. They heard about all of the possibilities of Jesus. And when they were singing Hosanna, they were saying, Yay, hallelujah, save us. And they were saying, basically, save us from Roman rule. They were trying to... to Honor him not for who he really was and what he was going to actually do for them because they were not listening to what he had been saying. They were only seeing things through the eyes of their own need, of their own want, of what they wanted to get out of what he could do. And so they are selfish in their hosannas. 
How do I know that? Because a week later, what did they do? Yeah, exactly. So, but you see, Jesus knew all of that. He knew exactly what was going on. Um, they were excited, but he knew it would pass. But you see, Jesus didn't come so that he could be exalted in that moment. Jesus came to come. That's what he came for. He was on his way to do what he knew needed to be done. And as he approached Jerusalem, he was aware that his journey this week was going to be his final days of approaching Jerusalem as the Son of Man. He knew what he was doing. He was coming so he could go. So he could come. Right? So he's going to go back to his dwelling place in heaven. But he was happy about that. But he also knew that this is his final week. And he knew that he was going to pay a lot of price for us. While he's coming, he knows he's going to be betrayed. He already knew it. He knew that his disciples were going to fall apart. They feared death more than they loved him in the moment. They would go into hiding. They would not be there when he needed them. He knew that they wouldn't even stand with him in the worst moment of his life. When he needed them to pray, they would fall asleep. And yet he walked forward because he came so he could come he would endure it all because he had inside of him uh, he was so aware of the results that it would bring that he would keep coming for you and he would keep coming for me and he wouldn't stop and he wouldn't hesitate, but that doesn't mean that he didn't think about it. Jesus was the son of man. He was the son of God, but he was the son of man. And he was preparing himself for what was going to happen, but he was trying to prepare his disciples too. And in John twelve twenty three, he said, The hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. And he, he wants them to understand what's going to happen and why. So he tells them, okay, listen, you're, you're not hearing me. I could just see Jesus like getting frustrated because he's been trying to tell them the story of what is going to have to take place and they can't grasp it. And he said, all right, let me tell it to you this way. You're used to parables. I'll, go, I'll speak it to you this way. Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He's talking about himself. He, he's using a parable, but he's saying, I'm going to die. But in that death, I'm going to produce. And he goes on to say, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he's talking about eternity. Jesus only has eternity on his mind. If we really follow him, we will have eternity on our mind. We're going to stay focused on things that have eternal value, eternal worth, something that is going to last forever and ever, not the temporal things. We don't have to worry about the temporal if we keep our minds focused on the eternal because when our minds are temporal, because the temporal is temporal. Temporary. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Follow me. Because where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Ugh. 
If you didn't have any other th- reason why to follow Jesus, the fact that the creator of the universe will honor you, if you do, you should do it. I mean, okay, I won't say that because that wouldn't be very nice. But that, you can only imagine what I was going to say. And I won't tell you. <laughs> so this is the time that the Son of Man needs and knows that he needs to be glorified. And he knows that if we follow him in servanthood, that we would be honored. So honored as what? Honored as sons and daughters, grafted into the family of God by Jesus and his sacrifice. He knows what is coming, and he's still wrestling with the reality. Because he is the son of man, he's wrestling with the reality of what he's going to face. John 12, 27 says, Now my soul is troubled. So he's saying, you know, I have emotions. I have feelings. Jesus had feelings. He was tempted in every way like as we are, but yet without sin. And so what what would the temptation be? I mean, he's on his way to the cross. He knows that when he's riding into Jerusalem, these are the last moments of his life before he's going to be tortured. And he's like, I am troubled in my soul. I'm troubled in my thoughts. I'm troubled in my emotions. He, he's like, if, if people could understand that I'm having difficulty here, but I'm going to give you the remedy immediately. And he said, but what shall I say? Like he's saying, I have the same stuff you have. But here's what I'm going to say about that. Father, save me from this hour? Nope. Because for this purpose, I came to this hour. He's like, you know, this is not going to be easy for me. Everybody just sees the cross. They see Jesus hanging on the cross. You know, we've seen the beatings. We, you know, we know that that was brutal. If you haven't seen it, you need to watch The Passion of the Christ because it, it will make you appreciate every stripe he took for you to be healed. But, but we still don't understand what went on on the inside of him. We still are, are a little bit short of understanding that Jesus wasn't just the Son of God at this moment. He was the Son of Man. And so all of his emotional realm is engaged in knowing what is going to happen. And, and how do you like it when someone betrays you? And how do you like it when the people that you always counted on are not there when you call? How would you like it if you had given them every single thing you have and you have led them down every road with them and you have been their friend and their teacher and their guide and you have loved them and you have showed them the way you love and when you need them, you look around and there's not one. Don't tell me Jesus didn't suffer for us. Do you know why he did that? So that when we turn around and there's not one, there is one. Because we are never alone because of his sacrifice. Okay. You know, he had to be thinking, he's, he had to be thinking, these disciples aren't really too worth it. You know, I mean, Jesus is like, I don't know. I know what they're going to do. And I'm going to go through all of this and they're all going to scatter. And, he, and, you know, and then what about us? We're so awesome that he'd be willing to do it for us? How many of you lived a wonderful life that he could be <laughs> glorified through every minute, Right? So he's like, okay. But then Jesus saw past all of our frailties. He saw past the failures of the disciples. He went into the future and saw what they would be. And he knew that his, the price that he was going to pay was going to enable them to actually accomplish what God had set out for them to do. 
And so he looked at us and he said, oh, well, they're worth it too. Because it's not because of what they may be doing in the present. It's what I know they can become. And they will never be able to become it if I don't be who I am called to be and be the sacrificial lamb. Okay. So, in his... In his soulish fight, he grabs himself, just like we need to. And he said, Father, glorify your name. He's like, I'm surrendering. I'm not going to think about this anymore. I'm not going to pay attention to my emotions. I'm not going to give in to this. Instead, I'm going to call on my father and I'm going to declare why I'm doing it. I am doing everything ultimately to glorify the name of my father. And so he screamed out, Father, glorify your name. And the most wonderful thing happened. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. Woo! Now, what is God saying here? What is, what is he trying to convey? I mean, we know why Jesus is stating what he's stating, but why did God say, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again? I'll tell you why. Because he is saying that in, his, in making man, in his image, and in his likeness, they were a part of the carriers of God's glory. When Adam and Eve fell, Jesus was on deck. This was not plan B. God knew in advance that this is what was going to happen. And so he said, he goes, okay, I glorified, I was glorified through man. They fell. You're coming. My name is being glorified now, and it will be glorified again because man is about ready to be reconciled to me, and they're going to go back to the former state, the initial state that I always planned for them, and that is for them to take dominion and to rule and to take positional authority. I am glorified and I will be glorified again because man is going to line up because of the sacrifice. Hallelujah! That's a good Hosanna place right there. And so he was purposed to come. He was purposed to come with restoration. He was purposed to come with our salvation. He was purposed to come with freedom. He was purposed to come to conquer death, hell, and the grave. Amen. Amen. So that all of God's sons could enjoy restored relationship with the Father and walk in their purpose. And walk in their purpose. Say, I'm going to walk in my purpose. Yeah. So the people who, could you imagine the people standing around? I mean, God just spoke from heaven. And they heard it too. You know, God could have talked to Jesus from the inside. He did know his father's voice. I mean, he said, I don't even do anything unless I hear his voice. So you don't think God was like booming from heaven all of the time around his disciples all the time, right? So there's a reason why. God is making sure that all the people also hear this. And so he, he, is, he is speaking it out in their ears also. And it says in verse 29, Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. <laughs> and they thought an angel has spoken to him. Just imagine this. They said it thundered because that's probably the greatest way that they could describe what they heard. If you've ever been in Israel, Israel has storms that happen and they happen intensely and randomly and out of nowhere and they're loud. And so um, Israel itself is almost like in a, 
It's built on purpose, like it has a concave ability so that when Jesus preached on the mount, everybody could hear him and they didn't have microphones. I mean, it was designed by God so that it was a place of amplification. And so when he thundered that day, (laughs) it thundered all over. People everywhere could hear what God was saying because God was foretelling what was about ready to happen to the sons of God. Okay. And so the people were saying, oh, it's, it's, it's like thunder or it's an angel. And, and Jesus takes the time to explain it to them. And he says, this voice did not come because of me. Because he could have said it. Hey. It came because of you. And I believe that God is trying to tell the church. He's trying to bring the bride back to the reality of who you are. He is speaking today and he's thundering truth among his people and he is, he is thundering for our sake. There is, there is a war going on right now in the same way that Jesus said that he was troubled in his soul. You are troubled in your soul. There are so many people that are in circumstances that they don't understand. They're in, they have all kinds of things. And you know, all of, the, all of the noise, there's so much noise. We're so used to living in noise. You know that it's not healthy to have this much noise? We have noise every minute. We have all kinds of noise. We have too much noise. And so we have a hard time concentrating on what is truth. We have a hard time getting our minds settled down because we're so constantly stimulated that we think we need to be stimulated at all times. And that's why people are not satisfied with God. They want to be stimulated all the time. Well, let me do something. Let me do it major. I want to change the world. I want to change. There's nothing wrong with wanting to change the world. But what is your motive of changing the world? So that you can feel good or so that someone else can feel good? It's like when you give to the poor. Are you giving to the poor because you care about the poor? Are you giving to the poor because you can write a check to make yourself feel better? The motive of our heart is what God is after. He is like, don't make these decisions based upon the noise. Don't make it based upon what you feel. Get your emotions under control and say, Father, your name be glorified. And so everything we say, everything we do, every action that we take, every step that we take, we should be wondering, is it glorifying you? Is it glorifying you? Is this going to glorify you? Is what I'm saying going to glorify you? Is what I'm doing going to glorify you? Am I doing it with the right intent? Is it glorifying you or is it glorifying me? And so, Jesus went forward. He accomplished this. He did it so that we would be empowered to walk in his victory and take our dominion back again. He did it so that we would understand the ultimate battle occurred. It already occurred. Because he said in John 12, 31, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Oh, yay. So who was the present ruler of the world at that time? The devil. It wasn't really the Romans. It was the devil. When man fell, he got notoriety. He took authority. They gave their authority to him. When Jesus came... He said, now is the judgment of this rule and the ruler of this world cast out. Adam and Eve's sin may have empowered him, but now he came so that this is going to be a done deal. He says in 
The next verse, and if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He is talking about hanging on a cross. He's going to be lifted up from from the earth, but he's saying, I am doing it with purpose, and he is going to do it so that everyone has access to the Father once again. Because he knew on that cross there was something amazing. The worst thing for him and the best thing for us was about ready to happen because he took every one of our sins, every one of our sins, on his back until he suffered and suffered. And then he cried this, it is finished. And you know what was finished? The rule of the devil. What happened in that moment was the kingdom of heaven took over the kingdom of darkness and Satan trembled because guess what the next action was going to be? Hey, give me those keys. I'm taking back death, hell, and the grave. You just lost and I just won the victory. And guess what? I am the son of God and I just raised up many sons and many daughters of the most high God. We have something to say Hosanna to the king about today. Oh my goodness. Finish, you're finished. When the devil comes to you and he tries to tell you something that is not according to the word of God, if he tells you you're going to be in lack the rest of your life, say it's finished. When he tells you you're not going to get healed, just say it's finished. When he tells you it's impossible for your children to return to the Lord, just say it's finished. We don't have to be in a fight with him anymore. He has won the war and we are his co-workers. Amen. Amen. Okay. God didn't just rescue us. God positioned us. You need to write that down. He loved us so much that he didn't just rescue us, he positioned us. Ephesians 2, 4, but God, who is rich in mercy, I'm so happy for mercy. Because of his great love, I'm so happy for love. With which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, which makes him God and not us made us alive together with Christ. He made us alive together with Christ. I don't think we get this. I mean, by grace you've been saved, by the empowering presence that is upon our heart that enables us to be who he's called us to be and to do what he called us to do. That is the definition of grace. He made us alive together with Christ. When we were dead in our trespasses, he's like, this ain't going to last. I'm going to take care of this for you. You're going to come alive in a different way. You're going to be just like me. Don't leave here saying I told everybody they were Jesus Christ. There is one Jesus, and there is one Christ, but there are many sons and daughters. Got that? Okay, good. (laughs) I have to always correct. Okay. Woo! Okay. So... He said, and he's raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When Jesus was done, dying, taking all of our sins, taking away the keys, and he went up to the Father, he sat down beside him, and guess who was sitting beside him? Yes! Okay, and raised us up together. I mean, like, Jesus is like, okay, I'm going to do it all. Because when I ascend, they're ascending. When I go, they go. You see, I'm going to restore relationship with the Father. I mean, you got something to say to Daddy? Well, just lean over and whisper in his ear. Because you're sitting in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. You don't have to do all of this All of these things that people have lied to you about. (laughs) We don't have to earn our way. 
We don't have to do X, Y, and Z to get to the Father's ear. We are sitting right next to him. We don't have to scream. We don't have to beat ourselves. We don't have to uh, prove ourselves to him. Jesus proved our worth by laying down his life. You are worthy because his worth is inside of you. Amen. Mm. Okay. We're all sitting with him. Everyone who believes in him. Everyone who recognizes his price. Everybody who says you are the Christ. The son of the living God. It's the only requirement. But it's not words. It's revelation. It's like, are you kidding me? When you read, when, when you read or when you hear the words of, of God like you're hearing today, there is, there is an atmospheric condition that begins to happen. It's called Holy Spirit atmospheric condition and he comes and he changes the atmosphere and he begins to to deal with people's hearts and and he begins to tell you from the inside he's pulling on the truth that is already deposited inside you you were also fashioned before the world existed he knew you Jesus was already slain before the foundation of the world for you the Holy Spirit, he comes when, when there is the word of God being presented with truth. And he comes and he says, this is truth. And he awakens DNA. He awakens what is already residing on the inside of you. And you're going, it's true. It's true. I don't know. It's so weird. But I feel like it's true. I don't know how to get there, but I feel like it's true. And when you hear what Jesus has done, all of a sudden you want to know him. And you don't just want to know him. You want to recognize him as who he really is. And when you recognize him for who he really is, he doesn't just become your friend. He becomes your savior. And when he becomes becomes your savior he becomes your lord because all you want to do is praise him and thank him and live your life in a way that pleases him because you're so in love with what he did to rescue you amen i mean what what do we have to worry about no matter what comes against us, he is with us. He goes before us. He prepared the way. He defeated the enemy. He gave you authority. What is your problem? <laughs> it is finished. Amen. Ooh. All right. Okay. Ephesians 2, 7, back to the word, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. We're, we are his riches. Oh, you know, all right. If any of you are parents, or if you're not parents, if you have a niece or nephew, or, or if you have grandchildren, or I don't know, if you see a child, okay, <laughs> if you've ever seen a child, <laughs> then, then you can understand that inside of you, there is some thing that happens by the Spirit of God, and there is almost a necessity to love them. When, when a child is born, you just... You can't put them down. You just want to look at them all day. Like, oh, these are the cutest. These, this is the cutest thing that ever happened to the whole world. I just want everyone to know. That's why we have so many Facebook pictures. So the whole world can see how cute your baby is. I'm fine with that because I like to look at babies. Babies make me happy. And so, and then they grow up and you'll do anything for them. You'll, you'll do anything to help them, even if, you're, even if they don't belong to you and you see a child in need, which one of you is not going to give 
to that child and don't raise your hand because I'm going to have trouble. <laughs> you don't want to make your pastor stumble. And so when we see a child in need, it, it, it's bowels of mercy that happen. You start feeling mercy for them. And that's what happens. That, that God looks at you and he goes, oh man, they're my riches. Like you are God's reward. Whether you think you're worthy or not, you're his reward. Oh my goodness. Because of his kindness towards us, because of Jesus, he's looking at us and he sees Jesus all over again. He's like, you're so cute. Oh yeah, you look just like my son. It's like, we're molded in his image. You know, I mean, you know, when we get to heaven, we're all going to have glorified bodies. I'm so happy about that one. And so we're going to like know what, what we knew here. We're going to know as we were known, the Bible says. But, but we're going to have glorified bodies. We're going back to that place that they were, Adam and Eve, they, they didn't even know they were naked until they sinned. You know why? They had glory all over covering them. You couldn't see their nakedness. They didn't even know they were naked. They didn't need any clothes. They were covered in his glory. And he goes, oh, man, I'm rich. He looks down at the world today. We look at the world and we go, oh, man, he's poor. And Jesus looks down and he sees, he sees people in their potential. And he goes, I'm rich. Because he knows that there's a deposit of grace that has been put in every individual that can come to life in his presence. And he goes, I'm rich. And he's saying to the church, let me be rich again. Let me see the culmination of you understanding and get in a revelation of who I am. Let me experience what I know you can experience. This is for your own good. Recognize me. Honor me as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and see what happens to your life. He made it so that if we are poor, we can prosper. He made it so if we are sick, we can be healed. But he didn't stop there. Oh. Thank you for that, Lord. But then he said this. You see, I have to go to my father. But when I go, the Holy Spirit is going to come. And then you are going to be able to do greater things than even I. Imagine that. Imagine that on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus took time to heal people. He took time to raise the dead. He took time to show us compassion. Do you know why he did that? Because he was modeling it for you about how you were going to act. He was like, don't think you're, you have no power. Satan is defeated. I empowered you with my resurrection. And now what lives inside of you is resurrection power. I say, well, I never experienced that. Well, if your dad dies, you will. I mean, I'm just saying. We were in a restaurant and my dad was, he kept telling me, I'm, I don't feel good, you better pray for me. I'm, I'm like, okay, you know, you do the prayer. You know, the quick prayer, we're eating. We're like... <laughs> We're not doing the mm, prayer because we're at the table. And he goes, no, I really mean it. I, I don't feel good. And I'm like, okay. So all of a sudden he turns, uh, yeah, gray. Is gray the right word? His, his tongue hangs out of his mouth. He's like hanging down like this. He slumps over. I'm like, like there is no life in this man. Tears was there, so... I mean, since we were there, we know this is true. And I went. All of a sudden, some kind of power that I didn't know I had was resurrected inside of me because I knew that there was going to be a resurrection because that man was not leaving me right then. And I said, I took my fingers and I shoved his tongue back in his mouth and I shut his mouth so he couldn't come back out again. And I said, Jack McCann, you get back in your body right now. You're not leaving me yet. 
In Jesus' mighty name, you live and not die. And then I went praying in tongues, scaring everybody in the restaurant. Don't care. Okay? Because when you need it, you need it. And when I need it, I had it. And my dad lived. And when he died, it was time for him to die. Oh, glory to his name. It was a cute little Baptist pastor that was sitting next to me, <laughs> the poor man. And so we had been talking, and, and he knew that I prayed for my dad. But, but when I went into action with the Holy Ghost, with the defeat of the devil as a reality to me on the inside... We had exchanged cards. He called me later. He goes, I didn't believe in speaking in tongues until today. <laughs> he goes, I have never experienced anything like that. He goes, whatever that was, that was power from God. And I saw your dad come alive. I go, I know. <laughs> Isn't he wonderful? And that is why we can never be ashamed of what we have been given. And we are not only saved, but we are sanctified. We are delivered. We we are empowered and the Holy Ghost lives on the inside of us and we will never be ashamed of him because he gives us the ability to glorify his name. Guess whose name got glorified that day? Jesus' name got glorified that day. The Father got glorified that day. Everything was about them. It had nothing to do with me except for there was a need. You are the same. I might be the prophet. I might be the pastor. It's nothing but titles. You understand I have positional authority because of that. That's fine. I have positional authority and you should listen to me. If anybody would ever listen to me, it'd be great. But you should listen to me. Because <laughs> I have wisdom for you. Because God gives it to me. However, he has the authority that he has given to each one of you to be empowered to do what he's called you to do and to be what he's called you to be. I can't be you. You can't be me. But we can be his. And we can glorify his name on the earth. Amen? I I'm intending to do so. Aren't you? Okay. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm closing. I know this is a miracle. It's early. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship. What are you? Look at somebody and say, you're his workmanship. Yeah. Well, imagine that. Okay. Oh, I do want to imagine that for a minute. Okay, so if you are his workmanship... That kind of means that he took time to build you the way he built you, doesn't it? He made each one and created each one of you equally. But he made you unique. He made you special. I mean, your thumbprint, your hand, you know, all of us have this different. Then I read our tongues are different. You know, why? Our, eye, our eyeballs are different. Like, why did God take so much time... He counts the number of your heads. I mean, what kind of an angel has to do that every day? I know. <laughs> Hairs. Oh, what I say? Heirs? Oh, no. <laughs> hey, that works in some cases, but. <laughs> Hairs <laughs> on your head. I know. I keep them busy too. Okay? And then what, one, one day, what looked at one color, the next day may look another color. And the angel's going, what's up? You know. Right. <laughs> Nobody gets that but girls. Okay. Because when men get older and their hair goes white, we all go, oh, aren't they handsome? And then a woman's hair goes white, except for Billy Kay's, who's beautiful. <laughs> and Helen's, which is beautiful. I'm covering myself here. But they are beautiful. Yes, they are. But it doesn't look good on me. <laughs> Okay, so this will be the color of my hair. <laughs> the original intent of God was brown for me, and it will be brown. <laughs> he declared it to be so. <laughs> okay, 
So we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, created in him for what? That's right there. Read it. Let's hear me. Come on. What are we created for? Oh, you're supposed to be good. And you're not supposed to be lazy. (laughs) It's good works. That doesn't mean, he didn't say, I created you to be a fat, fluffy angel floating around on a cloud. He goes, I created you, and I, that you are my workmanship. Like, I put you all together so that you are made in Christ Jesus to do something good. He goes, but, but you have to walk in it, that we should walk in them. He can, he can give you every ingredient you need. If there's any teachers in here, which I know we have some, but if, if you have people in your class and you know that they're smart and they keep flunking because they're lazy, you get frustrated because you know that what their potential is and you're trying to get them to enjoy their potential. You're not trying to, to abuse them to get them to listen. Am I right? But you just want them to be all they can be. And you know if they don't learn how to spell, well, no, spelling's bad. We got, I know. We, we have those things now, spell check. Okay, if you don't know how to read, there you go, you can't get the, you can't absorb the word right. So if they refuse to learn their words, that's what Jesus is trying to convey to us here. He's like, he's like, listen, I, I prepared, you're a workmanship of a- actual God, and you're inside of me, and I have things that you're supposed to do, and you're supposed to walk in them, but you have to walk. Just walk. Just, just take what I've given you and do something with it. So, Jesus was victorious, and he was divor- victorious, he is victorious, and his victory is eternal. Amen? So he is glorified when we walk in the victory that he won for us. If we want to glorify his name, that's how we do it. And so he prepared these good works for us. And here's some of the, he spelled out for us. We can hear God's voice and obey him. Do you know that you are designed to hear God's voice? He said, well, if you're his sheep, which we'll take care of that in a minute. If you are his sheep, that means if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are now part of his flock. And he said, if you are my sheep, my sheep hear my voice, and no other voice will they follow. So you were created, and Jesus won for you the ability for you to hear the voice of God. You may not all hear him audibly, but you can all hear him internally. Amen? He, he went through all of those sufferings so that we can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That's what he told us. Good works. If you're around somebody and they're sick, pray for them. Well, I did that and they didn't get healed. I go pray again. You know, what, are we going to stop praying for people because it didn't? I mean, everybody I pray for doesn't get resurrected from the dead either, but I'm not stopping. You know, we've had people healed of cancer in this church, but not everybody got healed of cancer. Some people had to go to the doctor to help their healing, and that's okay too. But I would much rather have everybody have an instantaneous miracle, wouldn't you? Well, is it because Jesus didn't provide it for us, or it is because we're not walking in it? right so if you're going to go for a walk you have to exercise i mean tell me about it (laughs) so so there was there was a struggle in my walking you know but and then i had to learn to exercise muscles that hurt all over again And in your walking, sometimes your walking doesn't feel so good. 
But if you just keep walking, pretty soon you'll be running and your running feels great. Then you're not going, oh my gosh, and wake up in the morning and go, oh, oh, that hurts still. You quit thinking those thoughts because now you're energized by the truth of God and you have exercised, you have walked, you have taken hold of that which God says you can have. And now you are understanding that what he did for one, he would do for you. Amen. Amen. Okay. How about casting down demons? I mean, you know, it's not one of my personal favorites. But if someone has a demon that needs to be cast out, it's one of my personal favorites. Because I hate the devil. And we're allowed to, we're supposed to actually. And if we see somebody under his control, and we are filled with his glory, and we are filled with his resurrection power, Satan has nothing that he can hold on to when a man or woman of God stands in their positional authority and says, come out. There's no argument. You know, I remember back in the day they used to talk to him. I'm like, why are you talking to a demon? They lie. They're, he's the father of all lies. What do you think he trained his cohorts to do? They lie. What's your name? I don't know. They make something up. You know, what, what do you mean, what's your name? Just go. Just get out. You're not allowed to be in there. Go. And they have to go. Because they have no authority unless you give them authority. If they're in your presence, they got to go. If you know who you are in Christ. Amen? Okay, because he said this in Luke 10, 19. Ugh. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. I'd rather not do that but I could if I had to. <laughs> oh, I am just such a visionary. Okay. <laughs> I'd much rather cast out a demon any day. Okay. And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing, say nothing, nothing, nothing shall by any means hurt you. Why? Because he's given us authority and all the, over all the power of the enemy. Who's got the authority? Yeah. Okay. And so God's voice didn't just thunder. He wants us to use our voice to thunder too. He wants you to use your voice to thunder. He wants the whole world to know that he has raised up a bride who knows who they are and that they are doing exploits in his name. And they're not ashamed to be who he's called them to be and to do what he called them to do. No apologies. Amen. Hallelujah to his name. The next time Jesus comes to Jerusalem. <laughs> I was there. I stood in the Garden of Gethsemane. I was by a tree that was old enough to be the tree. I mean... Maybe it wasn't the tree, but to me it was the tree. And I'm like, Jesus was here. He was right here in this garden. And if you're standing in the garden, then you look over and across the street, because you know they have streets in Jerusalem now, across the street you see this walled up part of the temple. And it's walled up because... No one can go through that gate. They think it's because there's graves there, but really God just had them make graves there so that nobody would go through that gate because it is reserved. It is reserved for a triumphant re-entry. When Jesus comes back through that gate in Jerusalem, he is coming as a king of kings and the Lord of lords, and we are coming too. We have a lot to praise him for. So right now, I just want to ask you, if there's anybody here, just close your eyes for a moment. And if there's anybody here and you say, I don't know Jesus that way. I, I didn't realize everything he paid for me. I didn't know the emotional part. I didn't know he could heal me of that. I didn't know I'm supposed to do all these works. I, 
I, I want more of Jesus. I, I don't know him, or maybe you know him and you just want more of him. I want you to raise your hand so I can pray with you. You know, Jesus wasn't ashamed to hang on the cross for you. You shouldn't be ashamed of him. Okay. Okay, Father, I just thank you for... I thank you for your words. I thank you for what you have given us. I thank you for the value that you have invested in us. And so we turn our attention right now, right here, back to you. And we are determined to not only praise you, but to praise you loudly. We, We are not just here today to just sing lightly but lord we are here to shout we are here to proclaim you not for what you can do for us but lord we are proclaiming you for what you've already accomplished for us and so we take this opportunity to praise your name and to glorify for who you are and we sing hosanna in the highest so we have some palm froms for you and we have a worship team and we are going to worship our king amen amen Did you get something out of that? All right. Go into Holy Week with appreciation in your heart for the King and what he did for you. And live your life for him. Amen. Yeah.